Hello. Welcome to session two of our workshop discussing and understanding animal welfare challenges in research and education on wildlife, non-model species, and biodiversity. I'm Sharon Schreiber, Senior Director of Programs at Public Responsibility in Medicine and Research, Primer, a nonprofit whose mission is to advance the highest ethical standards in research by providing support to the human and animal research oversight communities. I'll be the moderator for the session today. In part one of session two, titled Review Laws, Regulations, and Permits Associated with Fish and Wildlife, our speakers will identify the diverse regulatory requirements unique to wildlife that exist at multiple levels, including international, national, state, and local, including native lands. The presentations in this study include Adam Ferguson from the Field Museum of Natural History, who will present Animal Welfare Challenges in Research and Education on Wildlife, a Natural History Museum perspective. Lori Baton from the National Park Service will present challenges from the National Park Service perspective. And Caleb Hickman, representing the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians Office of Fisheries and Wildlife Management, will present research on, on tribal lands, unique examples. I'll now turn the session over to our speakers. So thanks, I'd like to start by thanking the organizers of this uh, workshop, very important workshop, in particular, uh, Dr. Bob Sykes for inviting me to give a talk today on the museum perspective related to uh, regulations for animal welfare and uh, wildlife versus uh, laboratory animals. And I'd also like to thank uh, Sharon, Caleb, Lori, and the rest of the crew for uh, some really productive discussions about this. So before we begin, I'd just like to provide a brief introduction. Uh, I'm currently the Nagani Collection Manager of Mammals at the Field Museum of Natural History here in Chicago. Uh, that job entails managing the more than 245,000 specimens of mammals, which range in size from pygmy mice to elephants with everything in between. Uh, and my time is split among uh, care, access, and support of the collection at 80% and research at 20%. And just uh, below there are some timelines of my uh, career trajectory, uh, finishing with my PhD in 2014 on skunks up through today. So from our training, we're all aware that science starts with good questions. And this quote by the American novelist Thomas Berger, that the art and science of asking questions is the source of all knowledge, I think aptly sums up, um, you know, the pursuit of knowledge through the scientific process. Uh, however, in reality, um, lots of logistical and real world problems or phenomena can, can structure either how those questions are asked or even which questions we can ask. So the reality of pursuing and developing such questions are often influenced by two major factors, um, uh, some of which are acknowledged and oftentimes are not, and that's regulations in fact can drive research, which is what we're here to talk about today. But at the same token, emotions can drive these regulations, which often impede or limit the scientific process, especially as it relates to museum science, as I'm going to discuss today. So regulations can drive research in a number of ways by influencing which species to study, for example, studying invertebrates versus vertebrates uh, to, to not have to deal with IUCUC regulations. Um, study objectives and methods, whether you do domestic or international work, as well as in particular lethal versus non-lethal sampling. And in turn, emotions can drive these regulations. I'm going to argue and point out today that there's a taxonomic bias associated um, with how animals are treated across the board. Uh, there's also the context, I think, of scientific resentment, this idea that um, scientists do whatever they want and don't adhere to regulations and rules. The who cares factors, like why is this important? Why should we collect more paramiscus and, um, maniculatus or deer mouse, the most common mouse in the United States? And, and that ties into that why do we still collect? And oftentimes, these, uh, pursuing these questions, in my mind, are equivalent to the game of Candyland, where you're moving across the board trying to achieve your objective, uh, and along the way you encounter various uh, regulations that influence how you pursue that question, or if you can even pursue that question. And then just a few of those are illustrated here, starting with obviously the most important, the, the ethical treatment and care and use of animals in research through the um, IUCUC committees. Uh, thus, such things as Animal Welfare Act or uh, even international treaties such as the Convention of Biological Diversity. Well, I'm excited today to uh, present the museum perspective because I, I think museums pr provide a unique um, relationship to the regulations that we're discussing in today's workshop. 
And I'm not going to get into the discussion about the ethics and morality of, of killing in the name of science. There's some great articles and philosophical discussions about that. But simply to point out that, you know, for museums and natural history museums, they equal specimens. Um, and these specimens are invaluable, especially in the context of the growing uh, mass extinction and the idea that we are losing species before we can even describe them. And natural history museums provide this expertise and the specimens for recording that taxonomic and uh, biodiversity. In particular, next generation collections also facilitate studies of complex biological interactions. And this is in particular in regards to the holistic and extended specimens, which can facilitate novel and interdisciplinary studies. There are often several examples of modern studies impossible without fresh material. And finally, uh, bats such as those illustrated here in this drawer, specimens such as the bats in this drawer, um, represent time capsules for studying change over time that are pretty much not represented in any other form or fashion. And this can include everything from disease, uh, pollutants, uh, extinction, and genetic diversity through time. And so, um, the fact that museums depend upon specimens and active continued collecting of specimens is partially uh, one of the reasons and ways that these regulations impact us in a unique manner. When it comes to permission for research and in particular to collect, there tends to be a taxonomic bias associated with the types in particular of mammals um, you are interested in studying. For example, sampling non-native rats lethally would tend to invoke a, uh, a mild to happy reaction as indicated in this emoji, whereas that for primates might lead to downright anger or uh, frustration. And although there are biological realities to why certain animals can't be sampled in the same fashion, often these are emotional knee-jerk reactions to the request. So. Regulations are often uh, not only biased in terms of uh, permission to collect, but they are, are taxonomically structured. And I have a case here uh, provided in hand for the Centers for Disease Control, the CDC, and how certain mammals are regulated. Uh, and I apologize, I'm a mammologist, so uh, nearly all of my examples for the rest of the talk come from mammals, although uh, obviously there's a lot more different kinds of animal diversity in natural history museums. But for example, bats and non-human primates are regulated by the CDC through the Division of Special Agents and Toxins. In contrast, African rodents and certain small carnivores, such as the genet here and the family Viviridae, are regulated by the Division of Global Migration and Quarantine. Then you have other taxonomic groups, uh, small mammals such as shrews, which are often collected uh, given their cryptic nature, and there's no real clear distinction as to where these individuals fall uh, under either of these agents uh, when it comes to import importation or dealing with them in uh, research settings. Following the example of the, the CDC, I wanted to point out a situation where the law as written does not follow biological reality. This is the case of when you are required to have an import permit regarding a potential specimen being infectious or non-infectious. And as the law states, with the exception of bat or non-human primate specimens, a permit is not needed if it's rendered non-infectious, including the treatment of formalin. So under this legal definition, Treating a bat and tissues as such with formalin would not render it non-infectious. In contrast, if you were to take a rodent and treat it in formalin, under the way the law is written, since it's not included in the exception of uh, clause there, it would be considered rendered non-infectious, which does, again, make no biological sense from a tissue preservation fixation uh, component. When it comes to mammals, moving on from rodents and bats alone, it's somewhat of a choose-your-own-adventure in terms of the types of permits and different agencies under which you would need to work with to obtain permissions to study them and conduct research. Uh, for importing and exporting, obviously U.S. Fish and Wildlife would be involved in all of these as well as Animal Care and Use Committees, but certain individuals or certain taxonomic groups such as bats and non-human primates include additional regulatory agencies and requirements through the CDC and CITES, or for marine mammals, the Marine Mammal Act uh, involves uh, NOAA as well as other groups. And um, for tenrecs and brush-tailed possums, you have the application of USDA and ungulates USDA as well. And the reality is these changes, uh, sorry, the amount of regulations and or permissions, uh, ability to obtain permissions to study or collect these animals has rendered certain groups not to be collected by museum scientists ever, even in the sense of salvage, ranging from marine mammals, non-human primates, and ungulates. In an attempt to demonstrate uh, how the different perspectives discussed in this section, whether that's the National Park Service, uh, tribal communities, or natural history museums, 
have to navigate the regulatory uh, path work that, that does mimic Candyland at times. Uh, we wanted to pick uh, common animals and what it would take to actually set up a study or research questions related to those animals. In the case of the Natural History Museum, I focused on two uh, marten species, one that's uh, domestically distributed in the U.S. and North America, and another that is found uh, internationally uh, in our case, which is the yellow-throated marten. For both cases, uh, you'll see text highlighted in red uh, for those that are associated with this study species that might work to hinder research or pursuing research questions related to that animal, whereas uh, attributes of the animal or regulatory regulations related to said animal that facilitate research highlighted in green. So as previously mentioned, the taxonomic bias associated with uh, small carnivores would come into play as potentially hindering research, as well as the fact that state regulations differ. Uh, compare, for example, Wisconsin, where this species is treated as endangered with no harvest, to that of Montana, where it's treated as a fur bear with no limit during a certain season. Uh, this latter component also brings up the issue of different how regulations are applied to commercial interest versus scientific interest. The no limit in terms of how many animals can be lethally harvested from a commercial perspective, so long as you follow the, the standard guidelines, uh, would be in stark contrast to a scientist applying to collect as many American barns as possible in that state. Uh, therefore, the lethal study could, could hinder research on a species of this status. Uh, the fact that it's done within our, our own country makes it a little easier and that the species is not listed as protected under CITES, ESA, or of conservation concern through the IUCN. Although similar to the American Martin in terms of uh, the impacts of its taxonomic trophic status on studies, in particular lethal studies involving this animal, there are other uh, obstacles and barriers with regulations, in particular one related to Animal Care and Use Committee, and that is obtaining and transporting appropriate drugs for euthanasia or an anesthesia, which is often illegal uh, given the illicit uh, nature of these drugs uh, in the U.S. and other countries. It also brings in the issue of specimen ownership if you're collecting animals in another country, uh, who owns that, uh, the country itself, the museum that where it's permanently stored, the people or the community in which that animal was taken from, etc. And then you have other uh, regulatory bodies, in this case CITES, where the country of India has listed this species as CITES 3, which means um, if you study it anywhere outside of India, it still requires a certificate of origin related to CITES. Uh, it is IUCN least concern, which again, although not a regulatory body, um, actually does influence permission to study these animals as I found. So in relation to the uh, animal care and use of, of animals in research, we're, we're often um, discussing the three R's, right? The replace, reduce, and refine. And these are very good guidelines for following and setting up studies and scientific questions related to animals, but they often are difficult when terms apply to natural history museums. So for example, replace the use of animals whenever possible. There literally is no substitute for a physical specimen in a natural history museum. So this replacement is, is almost impossible um, in terms of how we go about do that. Uh, reduce the number of animals needed to a minimum. This is possible. You can control or limit the number of specimens you collect, but that also limits your ability to study such thing as variation or example in disease. Uh, if your prevalence is 0.01 and you're only allowed to collect five animals, your probability of detecting disease or certain parasites, if that's the objective of your study, becomes infinitesimally small. Um, and oftentimes we find these limits are very subjective and not based on species biology. We often get that you're allowed to collect 10 per animal, per species, per site, um, which is not based in biological reality. And studies that have looked at the impacts of lethal collecting on these populations show that there, there are minimal or limited impacts on diversity measured in different ways for especially small mammals. So we need more studies and um, more limits based in biology and not on a gut feeling or knee-jerk reaction to which animals can tolerate which levels of lethal control. Uh, sorry, our lethal collecting. Um, and refine uh, tests to cause animals the least amount of distress. So there, you know, we, we aren't testing animals or testing certain things in animals typically in natural history museum settings. But guidelines do exist and are refined uh, constantly um, with this in mind, including minimizing um, uh, stress caused on animals trapped or collected in different settings. So in the context, especially of a museum perspective, I think it's worth adding, um, and, and science in general, uh, a fourth R, responsib responsibly, which is the idea that we should responsibly represent research and regulations to match biological reality. 
which often isn't the case. Um, that is, as a scientist, we should use objective, data-driven reasons for regulating and setting these regulations, not how emotion or um, personal opinion based on lack of, of strong data allows those regulations to be implemented or set up. Um, so these include one of the most impressive things I found about animal care and use committees in, in the country of Australia is that all studies, whether ecological or um, museum-based, require deposition of incidental mortalities into a scientific collection. So I think this is uh, the elephant in the room in many cases, the idea that ecology studies don't result in death, whereas natural history studies that are uh, seeking voucher specimens are uh, um, explicitly uh, focused on lethal sampling of animals. And the idea that um, animals are dying in these situations and are not required to be deposited in a natural history museum, I think is a, is a big loss in terms of uh, adding additional value to those specimens and reconciling the fact that non-lethal studies often uh, result in incidental mortality. I think it's also important that we regulate um, the justifiable lethal take of animals based on biology and not emotions that we work to realign regulations aimed at scientists to match other sectors. So I mentioned earlier the, the bias between the private sector and um, uh, scientific sector, and, and not to pick on Montana in that example. For example, in Texas, the mountain lion, puma con color, is a non-game animal, which as long as you possess a valid hunting license can be killed um, without any limit and um, done with as you please, whereas as a scientist to collect such animals, it would be nearly impossible. You can, uh, I think it's important that we work to re-examine restrictions not founded in these biological realities, such as the formal and fixation one, which is actually, I think, under the in the process of being re-evaluated by the CDC, but it takes months or years to change these laws once they're written. Uh, finally, reinforce effective communication and dialogue between scientists and regulators. I think this workshop is a great start. Uh, we're not enemies. We're actually working together to achieve the, the best scientific practice for the animals and scientists involved. And also, I think finally, to recognize the fact that regulations can and do often hinder research and the types of questions we ask, which is a, a natural uh, inhibitor or um, blockade to, to advancing scientific research and knowledge. I hope today's talk was informative, and although we couldn't cover all the topics regarding regulations, even alone for mammals, uh, I tried to cover some of the central themes, including the disconnect between biological reality and permissions uh, obtaining or pertaining to certain regulations. And with that, I hope this generates some uh, discussion, and I'm happy to take any questions, comments, um, suggestions, or advice. Good morning. I'm Lori Baton, the attending veterinarian and chair of the Animal Care and Use Committee for the National Park Service. As part of the Biological Resources Division, we use a One Health approach to protect and promote the health of wildlife, humans, and the environment within our national parks. These efforts focus primarily on managing and researching free-ranging wildlife populations. I have over 20 years of experience working with a wide variety of species, ranging from rodents, birds, and small mammals, scaling all the way up to moose and camels. I've worked for several federal and state agencies where the primary focus was on wildlife research and management projects. These experiences involve the use of wild caught or captive bred animals maintained in captivity, as well as free ranging wildlife. Most of my veterinary careers focused on disease ecology and wildlife species, but I also have been involved with development of wild animal research models and disease surveillance programs. The National Park Service interacts with wildlife in a variety of ways. Many of the national parks have long-term inventory and monitoring programs. Most parks use an integrated management approach for monitoring and controlling pest species. And biologists use a diverse set of management tools for monitoring and maintaining populations within various ecosystems. These are all in addition to conducting or hosting a wide variety of research projects. Park staff often work closely with surrounding state and tribal agencies on both management and research projects, as well as the many collaborative efforts with academic institutions. Under the direction of my predecessors, Margaret Wild, John Bryan, and Tracy Thompson, the MPSI Cook was established in 2010. The committee consists of 15 park staff with representation covering all 12 park regions. These staff are also chosen to provide a range of expertise for the species commonly involved with research projects across the service. In addition, we have two community members and an administrative assistant. We are registered as a research institution with APHIS. 
The MPS IACUC reviews approximately 150 protocols and amendments per year, with half of those received from academics with concurrent IACUC reviews. We follow the IRAC guidance and review all protocols that involve the handling of vertebrates. There are over 400 locations managed by the National Park Service. These include the large national parks, as well as the smaller national monuments, preserves, historic sites, military parks, or battlefields. This makes it challenging because each unit establishes their own risk tolerances and resource management criteria. It also makes it difficult to offer training opportunities, provide technical assistance, or conduct post-approval monitoring. Conducting research within the national parks requires park-specific scientific collection permits. This process can be cumbersome as researchers are required to have a separate permit for conducting research within multiple park units. Since wildlife do not recognize park boundaries, many research efforts also need to be coordinated with surrounding state and tribal land agencies. These are all in addition to other federal requirements or endangered species regulations. The MPS IACUC is tasked with reviewing all proposed research projects within park boundaries and tries to work closely with permitting staff at each park to assure compliance. In review of academic submitted protocols, the MPS IACUC may defer final animal welfare oversight to the concurrent institution, but often finds that modifications are needed to some activities to meet the higher standard of care expected to assure integrity of all the park's natural resources. We find that we often need to add conditions for approval to protect the welfare of non-target species and considerations for visitor and environmental impacts. We focus on seasonal impacts, such as during breeding and rearing stages, the use of appropriate euthanasia methods, capture methods, including appropriate trap checking intervals, as well as biosecurity measures. Another challenge we are facing is the recent change by journal editors to require ethical review statements with submissions of manuscripts. This is having an impact on the Park Service's ability to utilize data collected from the many long-term inventory and monitoring programs in scientific publications. The Park Service's philosophies have varied since the first park was established in 1916. But current policies allow for the management of wildlife populations as long as the management efforts do not cause unacceptable impacts. Management may be necessary because populations are unbalanced within an ecosystem or efforts are needed to protect cultural resources, other flora or fauna species within the ecosystem, or provide protection for humans, property, or accommodate development. One of the most common questions that comes to the IACUC inbox is, does this proposed activity require an IACUC review? Discussions then ensue to determine whether the activity should be considered as a field study, a research project, or a management effort. As mentioned, the NPS IACUC reviews protocols when they involve any vertebrate species. In our initial assessments, we tend to consider any capture and handling as having the potential to materially alter behavior, so we suggest that protocols be submitted for review. I think most of us working in the wildlife field will agree that there is a poor distinction between research and management. This is complicated by the lack of definitions for management, harm, or assessment of materially altering behavior in the Animal Welfare Act. The one I struggle with the most is defining what is considered momentary pain or suffering. This, in my mind, clearly varies when comparing the impacts of routine procedures for a lab animal species and trying to apply that to a free-ranging wildlife species. To help researchers, biologists, and academics who wish to work within the parks, the NPS IACUC developed a flowchart. This refined decision-making model shown here provides clear definitions and decision points to address the challenges of differing perspectives or interpretations. Using laws, policies, and guidance from the USDA, the criteria to distinguish research versus management activities is based upon the intent of the proposed work. To highlight the lack of differentiation between research and management, 
I offer the following two scenarios that we can then evaluate with the decision-making model. The first is project proposed by a park biologist who's interested in reestablishing a population of martens that had been extirpated from the park. The plan is to release captive bred martens from a zoo into their national park using established release protocols. All of the animals will be fitted with collars to monitor survival. The second project is proposed by researchers from an academic institution who are interested in trapping and collaring a population of martens in another park. The intent for this study is to assess habitat use and reproduction in wilderness areas and compare that to martens living in high human traffic areas. In both instances, martens will be handled, collared, and followed for several years, both projects hoping to recapture animals when collar batteries are due to fail. Animals are essentially handled in the same manner. Using this decision-making model, we can break down these two projects to help determine if they should be considered as research or a management project. We start by asking, what is the intent of the project? Does it achieve a desired resource objective? If so, then it could be considered as animal management. These activities are typically proposed by wildlife biologists or natural resource managers. And these management efforts are usually based upon well-established scientific knowledge. Examples include population control or stewardship actions. Many parks take actions to decrease human health risks from contact with wildlife. These involve well-established management protocols for dealing with situations such as human habituated large carnivores or removal of bats or rodents from high human traffic areas to decrease the risk of transmission of zoonotic diseases. These types of activities might also include animal handling and testing to monitor for disease emergence, such as white nose syndrome or chronic wasting disease surveillance programs in many of our parks. Where many of us wildlife professionals struggle is the fact that in accordance with the Animal Welfare Act, these management activities are not subject to review regardless of whether animals are harmed or undergo stressful procedures. So considering this, the first Martin project might be considered management because it meets the desired resource objective of establishing an extirpated population. If the intent of the project is to answer a scientific question, it is considered to be research based upon our decision-making model. These types of projects will use a scientific study design to test a hypothesis, compare or refine different techniques or treatments, or improve our understanding of a biological or ecological system. We would also review projects as research if they involve the use of animals to teach science or animal research procedures, as well as if the intent is to generate a peer-reviewed scientific publication. So considering these criteria, the second Martin project would likely be considered as a research project. But what if the biologists and the zoo staff in the first project want to generate a scientific publication using the captive release survival data? Then wouldn't both protocols require IACUC review? There are many projects occurring in parks that are purely observational or use humane methods for lethal removal of specimens for archiving in park or museum collections. As Adam reviewed earlier, these types of activities are exempt from the Animal Welfare Act. We have other projects that we finally refer to as bioblitzes. These are inventory and monitoring projects that involve minimal handling. Animals are captured by minimally invasive methods and handling does not cause harm or procedures do not materially alter animal behavior. These include projects such as inventorying of amphibian species in watersheds or bat species in caves. These activities are intended to be repeated at regular intervals to detect changes over time and often help to inform management decisions. As described in the recent APHIS Animal Care Tech Note, these activities would be considered as field studies. The MPS IACUC has a specific submission form for these, and they are reviewed to confirm that activities meet the criteria for a field study. We then issue an approval memo indicating the protocol has been reviewed and deemed to be a field study. No further IACUC oversight is required unless significant changes are made to animal and handling activities. Looking back at our Martin scenarios, 
either research group might choose to refine their animal monitoring procedures in future years and switch to the use of camera capture to collect reproduction data at den sites. As such, their monitoring efforts could now be considered as field studies. The current trend for biomedical research is the emphasis on non-lethal experimentations. Domestic species such as cats, dogs, rabbits, horses that are used in research projects are subsequently put up for adoption or can be used in multiple research projects over time. As such, the question as to whether or not animals brought into captivity should be returned to the wild is often brought up for discussion. Similar considerations could be applied to reintroductions with captive bred wildlife species. The Park Service does not have any dedicated research facilities, but does have a few that temporarily house wild animals for various reasons. These include a captive breeding and release project, as well as the California condor facilities where they treat condors with lead poisoning and release them back to the wild. Animals captured in parks and transported outside of the park for research purposes does occasionally happen, and the IACUC does not recommend the return of these individuals, but final decisions are made at the park level. When this does happen, strict biosecurity measures are outlined in written protocols, animals are returned to their site of capture, and seasonal considerations are made to assure there are no disruptions to breeding or rearing. The emphasis here is to maintain the park's natural resource stewardship, where considerations are taken for the risk of disease transmission, possible alterations to genetic and ecological integrity, and concerns for overall animal health as a result of being held in captivity. In closing, I've included here some reference materials that I always find helpful to share with individuals that are new to the review of wildlife protocols. The first is the citation for the decision-making model that should be in press shortly. The other article I would draw to everyone's attention is the 2013 paper by Kurzer and others outlining a 9R theory for ethical considerations in assessing impacts to animal and environmental welfare. I regret that I may not be able to attend the workshop in person due to work duties, but encourage anyone with questions to reach out to me by email. Thank you for your time and attention today. Oshionagad. Hello, everybody. I'm Caleb Hickman, and I'm the supervisory biologist for the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians. And today I'm going to talk a little bit about research on tribal lands. Uh, this largely comes from my experiences. I'm a tribal citizen of the Cherokee Nation of Oklahoma, and I work for the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians in North Carolina, which is in the Southern Appalachians. I spent the last 20 years uh, doing a variety of research projects on many different game, non-game species. I've managed um, and done my own research over the years. And for the past eight years, I've also included uh, research with tribes. And I've had a lot of experience um, and worked on projects with uh, other tribes as well. Here I provide some examples of the types of projects that we work on which range from inventory, monitoring, management, and research of a variety of species, ranging from fish to large mammals. Many other tribes have the same types of projects, especially when it deals with regulatory processes or trying to understand their resources and harvesting potentials. It's noteworthy that we do all of this with just a few staff members. In some tribes, don't have any biological staff at all and still have to achieve the same goals. A lot of these projects, if they have any sort of animal care and use, is through partnerships with universities. So it's first important to recognize who tribes are. Tribes are recognized by the United States government, and this is a government to government relationship. Currently, there are 574 federally recognized Native American tribes in the United States. Many of these tribes have their own form of government. They may or may not have land, but they all have this relationship with the United States. And this is largely 
through the United States Bureau of Indian Affairs. One important aspect about tribes is the natural resource management and how it's performed. Tribes are very diverse throughout our continent, having different languages and cultures and in different ecosystems. An important aspect to, that's different from states is that tribes are recognized by the United States government as sovereign nations with independent governments themselves. And also that land ownership can be a little bit different as well. The idea of ownership is probably foreign to many of the tribes, but it is important because these lands are protected uh, largely by the tribes, but also by the United States government. And that what this results in is a large biodiversity that rivals public lands and some of the most some of the world's most protected lands. So tribes have a long history connected to these environments, and it's valuable for researchers in managing and adapting to dramatic changes. So unlike states, we have that special relationship with our federal government, and we also share resources with state, federal, and private landholders as animals and the war waterways move across boundaries. Tribes also deal with large inequalities, and these are largely between states and tribes in comparison, such as internal funds. Tribes vary greatly in the amount of funding that they receive from revenue internally or from the federal government. Most tribes, in average, are at a 25% poverty rate. That's three times that of your Americans or states themselves. There's also poor representation in academia. There's only 41 tribal colleges, and very few of these have any sort of research focus. There's also limited research and management capacity with the tribes. And nationally, with only 0.7% of biologists that are tribal citizens. And most tribes can only afford to pay a single biologist and a couple of technicians to do a variety of projects like I previously listed. They might work on all manner of fish and wildlife for economic development, for harvesting, and for regulatory processes that I'll get to in a minute. What this results in is that tribes are now reliant on partnerships or they risk mismanaging these resources. A tale of two Martins from the tribal perspective could include a couple of different areas. And one is the federal protections or regulatory processes that come into play when an animal is protected or general research of a species on tribal lands for a variety of reasons might be a bit different from other places. Because of the protected land aspects that tribes have, they're often tied to the BIA process. BIA is responsible for 68.5 million acres of trust land for which they protect for the tribes and 57 million acres of subsurface minerals. Tribes often work through the Bureau of Indian Affairs process, but end up taking upon a lot of the work themselves to work with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service for protecting species. And this includes a lot of different normal federal processes that you might see on uh, uh, national park or national forest lands. The difference is the tribes have to live and grow an economy on these lands as well. So these can be um, difficult hurdles for different tribes to approach. So under Section 7 of the Endangered Species Act, there's a process at play. This largely will influence any federally recognized tribe that has protected lands of significant size or habitat diversity. And this will result in uh, the possibility where species, species may be listed under this ESA. And there are different permitting processes, such as a 404 permit, um, but these ESA 
guidelines are, are built to ensure that federal agencies act out programs for conservation of endangered species. And tribes can, can be uh, part of this as well. And this is called an interagency cooperation. It's a mechanism by which federal agencies ensure the actions they take, including those that they fund, such as protection of certain tribal lands or the management of those lands for the tribes. They don't jeopardize the existence of any listed species. Based on Secretarial Order 3206, it's important that tribes do not have a disproportionate burden based on the conservation of listed species. These federally listed species, however, do end up having a disproportionate burden on tribes compared to our state neighbors. It's obvious when people have trouble building a house or cutting a tree that might even fall in that house because they have to do surveys of these species before either of those could even take place. So how do we ensure that these burdens don't exist? One way to ensure that these burdens don't exist is through alleviating the burden through regulatory compliance processes that are laid out so that partners, both federal, tribal, and researchers can work together to limit these burdens. And this starts with obtaining proper funding, which can be difficult, but is possible through the Bureau of Indian Affairs. You can also hire specialists on these particular projects if capacity is minimal. There also needs to be input from tribal citizens, and then a plan can be developed. And these plans are also very important to be done with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and this is often considered a programmatic process. However, these processes never have any sort of animal care and use, even though there are studies that take place and potential threats to these animals. However, if there are endangered species, there has to be endangered species permits through the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. So researchers may approach a tribe to work with a marten, for example, or other species, and they do this for a variety of reasons. The species may be important to science in some way and may only exist on tribal lands. Or this species may cross boundaries and it's important for researchers to study the organism uh, on state, federal, and tribal lands. Tribes hold a significant land base, so including tribes in the research could be important. But also, tribes are often included in, in research these days through these new perspectives, or a perspective that's new to science today, which is a traditional ecological perspective of tribes. This topic has is, is become a lot more interesting to folks recently. Uh, and in 1993, Burks had had uh, come up with this table, but it's it's uh, it's really grown since this period, and has become uh, a topic that's uh, interesting for many people. But to do work on tribal lands takes different kinds of permitting. It may not take animal care and use permitting, but working with tribes and the people uh, could include a significant. Um, process as well. So even though researchers can obtain permits and work with tribes on different species on tribal lands, there can still be problems that arise. And some of these cases I can list right here, but, but it's a lot more extensive and is different across different tribes. But the Western science can also be considered a settler colonial science to many tribes. And that's because it's often invasive, or people are just searching for grants. It can be paternalistic in the way they approach the tribes, or it can be extractive so that the information that is gathered is never shared back with the tribe or is helpful for the tribe at all. So how do you combat settler colonial processes in science when researchers work with tribes? Largely through the co-production of knowledge. And what this is, is a contribution of knowledge sources from a variety of, of different stakeholders. And this could be folks that, that seem to think that the projects and working with 
tribes on an e even footing is productive. This is largely important, especially if animal care and use is required or needed. In research areas, tribes become reliant on these partnerships. Most tribes can't afford having a uh, animal care and use process in place. However, by working with universities or even federal partners, we can institute more research, but this does take away from the sovereignty. It's also good to point out that many tribes have their own processes. It might not be in the animal care and use process, but tribes are often approached by researchers and have their own processes like the Institutional Review Board or IRB. It could be through medical research, but also through cultural resources from which many natural resources are, uh, are, are contributed to. Here is an example of just a simple description from the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians. There aren't many tribes that even have these, but there are partners that do include this in the work. So anytime people are interviewed or part of the process for your research on tribal lands, an IRB is necessary and could help you in your research as well. And finally, I've listed a few references that might be of some help. And with that, I hope you've enjoyed learning a little bit more about tribes and how it might relate to some of the work that you do. Thank you. Hello. Welcome to session two of our workshop discussing and understanding animal welfare challenges in research and education on wildlife, non-model species, and biodiversity. I'm Sharon Shriver, Senior Director of Programs at Public Responsibility in Medicine and Research, Primer, a nonprofit whose mission is to advance the highest ethical standards in research by providing support to the human and animal research oversight communities. I'll be the moderator for this session today. In part two of session two, we'll hear three speakers present case studies and examples related to the laws, regulations, and permits associated with fish and wildlife, which we heard about in part one. Our speakers will discuss the realities of field research with respect to issues such as the diversity of species and types of studies, acquisition of animals, methods of capture, and non-target species. The focus of this session is to establish the scope of diversity for wildlife as compared to work with domesticated species and labs in terms of spatial scale, number and diversity of animals, and types and goals of animal activities. The presentations in this session include Lisa Tell from the University of California at Davis, who will present unique challenges when working with free ranging wildlife. Hummingbirds is a case study. Larry Heaney from the Field Museum of Natural History will present conducting biodiversity surveys in a new age of wildlife discovery. And Heather Bateman from Arizona State University will present field research involving reptiles and amphibians, remote study sites, and undergraduate students. I'll now turn the session over to our speakers. Good morning. My name is Lisa Tell, and for my presentation today, I will be highlighting challenges that researchers face when working with wildlife compared to traditional laboratory animals. Before we get started, I was asked to provide a little bit of background about myself. I'm a veterinarian and a faculty member with the UC Davis School of Veterinary Medicine. Historically, I was trained clinically at the National Zoological Park, and I've been very fortunate to have worked with wildlife for the past 32 years. I'm boarded in avian and zoological medicine and oversee the UC Davis Hummingbird Health and Conservation Program. I would say that working with wildlife has been a really wonderful experience. However, there are unique challenges given the substantial diversity in anatomy, behavior, and physiology. You also find yourself working in an uncontrolled environment and investigators find themselves having to balance the needs of the animals and the investigative team while still trying to accomplish research objectives. When working with free ranging wildlife, I find that it really pays to plan ahead. You have to obtain permits and get institutional animal care and use approval before you can even start your work. 
Being ingenuitive is also helpful because there are fewer commercial products for wildlife compared to laboratory animals. Since wildlife and the working environment can be unpredictable, meticulous planning is essential for protecting animal and human health. Lastly, if you're going to work with wildlife, I think that you have to be mentally committed to spending more time on tasks such as data reporting, developing field protocols, and planning for emergency situations. Being a veterinarian who has worked with birds my whole career, I realized that there's a really steep learning curve when working with wildlife, so I authored this monograph, which is published by the Texas Tech University, and I hope that it helps people navigate the process and highlights the importance of having a welfare-conscious approach when working with wildlife. Even though it is hummingbird specific, it includes permit and general concepts that might be helpful for other animal species. During today's presentation, I will use hummingbirds as a case study to highlight some of the challenges that investigators might encounter when working with wildlife. So before any research can start, one essential task is obtaining permits and institutional animal care and use approval. Depending on the type of work and the location where the work will be done, multiple federal permits may be necessary. And you also might need state permits and land use permits. Given that the IACUC committee members might not be as familiar with wildlife species, getting institutional approval might require educating committee members and that might possibly delay the process. Therefore, timing can be a challenge to ensure that all permits and protocols are in place when the work is supposed to start. One dilemma that seems to occur is that often IACUC might want to see approved permits and the permitting agency might want IACUC approval before they'll issue the permits. Therefore, the investigator has to balance those two demands. This is a portion of a table that's published in the monograph that shows details of what is and what isn't covered by different agencies issuing permits. It is really important for investigators to understand the conditions of their permits so that they can ensure that all activities they are performing are authorized. For example, holding a hummingbird in captivity for less than 24 hours for research purposes is only covered by my U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service permit. My bird banding laboratory permit allows me to hold a hummingbird in captivity for less than 24 hours only to ensure its safety and well-being but not for collecting research samples such as urine and feces. These distinction, distinctions can be very nuanced and complicated, but they're really important for researchers to understand so that they can be compliant with the various rules and regulations. When working with free-ranging wildlife, there's a broad array of situations and special considerations, and you really don't have the advantage of commercial products, a controlled environment, and standardized protocols that exist with traditional laboratory animal species. The items on this list are just a few things that make working with free-ranging wildlife a bit more challenging, and I'll be covering these today. But the list is definitely way more extensive, and throughout this workshop, I'm sure that you'll hear a plethora of challenges. The training necessary to properly handle wildlife is often extensive. People on the research team need to be proficient at proper restraint techniques because there might be safety issues for both the animal and the handler. Wildlife can range from venomous snake to a large vertebrate, therefore special training is necessary. The diagram on the left side of this slide shows the anatomy of a hummingbird, which is fundamental to understand so that a bird can be handled safely. Since birds don't have a diaphragm, the keel has to be able to freely move up and down so that air can move in and out of the respiratory tract. These images show a method for restraining a hummingbird for eye examination. As you can appreciate, with this case, there was trial and error and ingenuity to really figure out a system that would work and be good for both the bird and the investigator. This restraint block was designed by a colleague. It's a foam block that has a cut out central compartment that is used to contain the bird's body. Dual lock strips help keep the bird secure. Now this looks like a relatively simple design, but there are some important nuances. One of them is that the foam can't be too firm or it inhibits the bird from being able to breathe, but it also can't be too soft or the bird wiggles out of the restraint block and escapes. 
When working with some species of free-ranging wildlife, you have to determine the age, sex, and species of the animal, whereas with laboratory animals, this information is commonly known. An example of this is with hummingbirds, it's easy to identify the age, sex, and species of adult males, but it takes specialized training to be proficient at identifying the species of adult females and immature males and females. The image on the left shows a close examination of the beak, and what we're looking for are corrugations, which help age the bird. The image on the right shows the tail feathers, and these can be used to identify the sex and species of a hummingbird. For research studies, animals are often tagged or marked to identify individual animals. One consideration with free-ranging wildlife is to really think about how marking or tagging will impact the bird and balance that with the research objectives. These images show the bands that I use to identify individual hummingbirds. As you can see, these bands are extremely small, but that really isn't surprising given the size of the hummingbirds that I work with, which range from anywhere from about two and a half to four and a half grams in body weight. The image on the top left shows a band holder, and this was made by a colleague of mine. It helps to contain the bands so that I don't lose them when I'm working in the field. The bands are secured on the rods using large earring backs, and it's the silver earring back that indicates the end where the band which will be used next is located. The image on the bottom right is of a passive integrated transponder. I use these pit tags to identify individual birds and track their presence at research sites. In order to reliably get tag reads, I designed a system that requires the bird to fly through the antenna to get access to the hummingbird feeder. Once a hummingbird is inside the enclosure, the bird's pit tag is read every 10 seconds. Then the top of the enclosure is open and that allows the hummingbird to exit since hummingbirds tend to fly to the highest point. The next slide will be a video of this system in action. My intent of showing these methods is to demonstrate that a simple task of animal identification might require extra efforts when working with wildlife. Blood sampling is routine in a laboratory animal facility, but I think it requires special considerations when working with free-ranging wildlife. If possible, and if it doesn't disadvantage the animal, I will mark individual animals so that they are not resampled inadvertently. I also tend to reduce the traditional blood sampling volume since the animal's health status is unknown, or they might lose a little bit more blood than expected, and I want to maximize their fitness when they are released. The images on this slide are histologic sections of birds cut toenails. Cutting a bird's toenail is one method for obtaining blood samples, but it's important to know that they have bones in their toenails and you don't want to amputate the bone when taking a blood sample. Therefore, as a best practice, when I'm working with hummingbirds, I make sure to bleed them when it's nice and warm so that they have good blood flow to their toes, and I only cut the tip of the toenail so that I ensure that I'm not cutting at the level of the bone. Taking feathers from birds is another common sampling technique. Since free-raging wildlife are not in temperature-controlled rooms, it's important to ensure proper thermoregulation. Therefore, when I take feather samples from hummingbirds, I minimize the number of feathers that I take. This does limit the number of feathers that I sample, but the bird's welfare is more important. When I take feather samples from hummingbirds, I carefully sample small numbers of feathers from different areas, and I make sure that there is never any exposed skin. This is really important since hummingbirds don't have any down feathers. When sampling tail feathers, I'm mindful of the fact that for some species of birds, the male's tail feathers make chirping sounds that attract females during the breeding season. Sampling primary feathers is extremely rare and they should never be sampled when the hummingbirds are migrating. When working in the field with free-ranging wildlife, another added responsibility is to ensure the safety of the research team. 
I feel like you have to constantly watch for weather conditions, and in California, we also have to be aware of active fires. Mapping out the most efficient route to the nearest hospital could really save someone's life. In my case, when we're working in the field, the research team commonly encounters bees. Since we can't administer epinephrine to someone unless they have a prescription for an EpiPen, I advise people to bring fast-acting diphenhydramine even if they don't have a known allergy to bee stings. Also, when working in areas with rattlesnakes, I make sure to know which hospitals have anti-venom. Emergency protocols are really essential when working in the field. Also, if you're able to have team members take specialized training for emergency support measures, that can be really helpful. The last topic I'm going to cover is challenges of euthanizing animals in the field. If an overdose of inhaled anesthetic is going to be used, you have to be very careful to not have any fluid leaks so you don't endanger the person driving and transporting the anesthetic. I personally prefer not to have controlled substances in the field, so I have this mini CO2 chamber available that I designed for hummingbirds in case they are permanently injured and have to be euthanized. Fortunately, I've never had to use it, but it has a small CO2 cartridge that is connected to a regulator to help control the release of the CO2 and an outlet hole at the top. Any animal that is euthanized in the field with an overdose of drugs should be removed to avoid secondary poisoning of another animal. These are the take home messages from my presentation today. First of all, working with free ranging wildlife takes a strong commitment and researchers will want to be ready to face the challenges. Often due to limited fundamental information or the lack of commercial products, Working with wildlife requires thinking outside the box, definitely being organized, and having good time management skills in order to be successful in achieving research goals and also being able to spend grant money within the funding period. Finally, I have found that working with free-ranging wildlife is a privilege and can be extremely rewarding. In closing, I'd like to thank the workshop organizers for taking the initiative to tackle this important topic. The video on the next slide is one of my favorites and represents the ultimate goal for our research team, which is to successfully release a hummingbird. Thank you very much for attending today's session. Hello everyone, my name is Larry Haney. I'm the Nagani Curator of Mammals at the Field Museum of Natural History in Chicago. I'm going to talk today about um, some issues that come up with conducting uh, biodiversity surveys in the current age of discovery of uh, new species of mammals. In particular, the issues are, are broadly applicable, though, uh, to many, many other groups of organisms. There is a widespread perception that uh, mammals as a group are pretty well known at this point. So you know, we know how many species there are. We know approximately where they live. Uh, we've got basic information on their ecology. Some of them are well known, some of them less, less well known, uh, but we, you know, we know what's out there. Well, uh, research that's been done over, the, over recent years has shown that that is actually not the case. Um, a recent review by Bergen et al, shown here, um, has shown the pattern of, of the number of recognized species of mammals uh, beginning in 1750 and going up through the 2010s. And what you can see is that although uh, the numbers have fluctuated over the years and the number of species that were described in the early 1900s uh, formed the greatest peak, um, the number of species being recognized now, um, the number of increases in the numbers of species of mammals that we recognize is going up steadily. Um, in the 2010s, the estimate is that there were approximately 418 species added to the list that had not been there previously. The, some of these are the result of uh, detailed studies of of uh, things that had been previously recognized as subspecies, for example. Um, but at least half of these are the result of brand new discoveries of, of uh, mammals that we had not known existed previously. 
The result of this is that the number of species of mammals that are, have been recognized continues to increase steadily. Um, the number currently is somewhere around 6,500. Estimates are that um, we probably will hit at least 8,000 before this, this number plateaus out. And there are suggestions that it may go up as high as 10,000. Um, we have a very long way to go before we really understand mammalian diversity um, uh, sufficiently well. Rather than talk about this phenomenon on a global basis, I'm going to give an example from research that I and my collaborators have done in the Philippines. Uh, the map on the left shows the location of the Philippines in Asia. Um, it does lie within the tropics. Like a lot of tropical countries, there's been a tremendous amount of, of destruction of, of the original habitat um, throughout the country. Um, this map shows uh, some information about that. In 1900, it's estimated that 70% of the country was covered by old growth rainforest of some type, plus some additional second growth. By 1992, less than 8% of the original old growth was still present, plus roughly 12% second growth. Since then, there's been a, a small decline in that little bit of remaining old growth to about 6%. Uh, but the amount of second growth has actually increased um, to about 18%. Loss of habitat from agricultural expansion and from logging activities, often in, in rather steep mountainous areas, um, has had a devastating impact. Tremendous amounts of erosion and periodic floods that have a tremendous negative economic and social impact on the country. Now a bit about some of the mammals that we study there. Now, the first group that I want to mention are the ones that are known as cloud rats uh, because they, uh, most of the species live at high elevations in cloud forest. These animals range for, in body size from uh, the species that's down in the bottom right hand corner at about uh, six pounds um, to the little bitty one that's in the corner on the far left side, upper corner. Um, that weigh only about uh, 18 grams. Uh, these animals are sometimes described as being the Philippine uh, equivalent in some respects of the lemurs of Madagascar. They're arboreal animals that feed only on plant material. The second group that I want to mention are the ones that we refer to as earthworm mice. Uh, these are animals that live on the surface of the ground. Uh, they feed mostly on uh, invertebrates of various sorts. Most of the species particularly enjoy eating, uh, eating earthworms. Um, this is a morphologically very diverse set of animals, uh, ranging less in body size than the cloud rats, but much more diverse in their foraging ecology. Uh, some of them are burrowers, others skitter around on the surface of the ground and so on. We know that the common ancestors of each of these two groups um, arrived in the Philippines a long time ago. In each case, um, these, in, these entire branches on the tree of life occur only within the oceanic portions of the Philippines. In the case of the cloud rats, their common ancestor we estimate arrived 14 or 15 million years ago and have been diversifying within the Philippines, mostly within Luzon Island ever since. Uh, in the case of the earthworm mice, again, it's an entire branch on the tree of life that occurs nowhere else in the world, um, not even elsewhere in Southeast Asia. Most of them are on Luzon Island. Uh, their common ancestor arrived about 8 million years ago, and they've been evolving and diversifying there ever since. So where does the information come from uh, that I just presented to you about the diversity of these organisms? Well, um, in the year 2000, my collaborators and I uh, compiled information on the mammals known from Luzon Island, which is the largest island in the Philippines. At that time, we knew of 28 species of native non-flying mammals. So this excludes bats. They fly their somewhat different patterns of diversity and distribution. 28 species. Of those 20 species occurred nowhere else in the world, not even elsewhere in the Philippines. This map uh, shows the locations of the uh, species that, are, are, that were not widespread throughout the island. What you can see is that there are a number of mountainous regions that have um, in locally endemic species of mammals. One of the immediate questions that we asked was why, why are there not more of them 
why are there some places where we know of no endemic species of mammals? When we looked at the data, the answer became immediately obvious. Literally, no one had gone to look. So my collaborators and I began a program of, of comprehensive biological survey, uh, concentrated particularly in the areas where there had been no uh, mammal biodiversity surveys done previously, where we simply had no information about what lived there. Uh, the map on the left shows the locations where we conducted our surveys. Um, this uh, continued over uh, the period from 2000 to 2012, um, accumulating a total of 37 team months um, in the field, collecting specimens, collecting voucher specimens for our taxonomic uh, uh, studies that allowed us then to uh, document the extent um, and habitat uh, use and so on for the animals in these areas. The results of that, that uh, field-based biological inventory was even more dramatic than we expected at the outset. Um, again, here's that same map from what we knew in the year 2000 um, and what we know now. Uh, you can see that the number of species of native mammals living on Luzon Island doubled as a result of this. 28 previously unknown species of mammals discovered in the course of this project. 93% of those species occur nowhere else in the world, not even elsewhere in the Philippines. These findings also have some uh, significant impacts on um, uh, conservation of of this wonderful set of animals in a country where, where habitat destruction, uh, environmental degradation is a, is a very serious problem. One of the things that we've learned is that people get very, very excited when they're told that there is something that is absolutely unique that occurs in their backyard. Uh, the media in the Philippines um, really love hearing about this kind of thing. Um, as part of our efforts to promote conservation in each of the areas where we've worked, uh, we have produced posters um, showing the animals to engage people further, um, since often the people who live in towns um, have not seen these things themselves. Um, we print up anywhere from 200 to 1,000 copies of the, these posters and distribute them to conservation organizations, schools, government agencies, basically anybody who uh, might possibly be interested. This project, of course, has been uh, conducted in, in collaboration with uh, people from many, many organizations within the Philippines, universities, museums, conservation organizations, uh, and uh, government agencies in particular. When information is compiled then um, by the national government um, for their national red data lists, much of the information um, that uh, goes into those, those efforts about mammals comes from the work that our collaborative research group has produced. Uh, when it comes time to produce um, uh, strategies and action plans for protected areas, of course, the kind of information that we've gathered that I've shown you about centers of endemism um, is critically important uh, for all of the planning that takes place. Another area of, uh, in which this work has had an impact on conservation has, has pertained to specific national parks and the development of new national parks. Um, we can divide this up into three different categories. Um, first, uh, uh, areas where we discover large numbers of species of mammals that are previously unknown that are confined to a particular area um, is, it has a, a considerable impact. When we go into a government office, um, particularly the ones in Manila that make decisions about protected areas, and say, there's a place that has more species of endemic mammals than most countries in Europe, and it's just one mountain range, we suggest that you might want to consider having a national park there. The response very often has been, that sounds like a good idea. So the first five that are listed here are places where our discoveries of, of new species of mammals help to kick off this process. Now, of course, this is a more complex matter than this. There are lots of people who gets invo get involved, lots of different issues, um, but the discoveries of these mammals actually uh, has had a significant impact. 
There are others, a um, substantial number of others, where that had already been declared, but a fair number of these were paper parks that were largely being uh, ignored. Uh, the discovery of these new species helped to push them to a much higher level of attention. Um, and then finally on the right, um, there's another set of, species, of, of areas uh, where we've documented the shown number of new species of mammals um, that are under consideration for being declared as protected areas. So at this point, um, I hope that you see that there is some real value to doing this kind of research. I want to mention now very briefly uh, some of the challenges to, uh, to actually uh, carrying this out. Um, I think that probably for many of you, some of the issues have already become apparent. Let me give one example um, at this point, um, and that has to do with the kinds of questions that are typically posed by an institutional animal care and use committee. So in this case, um, they typically will ask some version of what species will be the target of your research? How many do you propose to collect? And how abundant are they typically in the area where you're going to be working? Well, in this case, by definition, we do not know what species we will encounter. The primary purpose of the research is to find out what's there, to discover new species, and to obtain the first information on distribution, evolutionary history, and the ecology of these animals that will allow that kind of question to be answered in the future. Once we leave the United States and arrive in another country, we of course are absolutely obligated to follow their legal requirements. Um, and uh, you know, much of the time that, that is, their requirements are very consistent with those in the United States, but not always. Um, I can give you um, an example that's a bit extreme, but I think carries the point well. Um, uh, quite a few years ago, I was very strongly recommended to use a euthanasia drug to kill any animals that we were going to keep as voucher specimens for our taxonomic and anatomical studies. If I had used that euthanasia drug, if I had it in my possession, I would have been immediately subject to arrest and imprisonment. Other kinds of things can come up too. Cultural practices in the tribal areas where we've worked, uh, of course, absolutely must be respected. And sometimes that can require some, some flexibility. Um, we've worked in some places where um, the local people have said, yes, you're, you're quite welcome here. We're happy to have you, but you must spend the night in the village. You may not go out into the forest at night. That requires some flexibility uh, on our part of when we check the traps that we have placed out in the forest. Uh, we can't necessarily do it on a, uh, a schedule that one might follow elsewhere. Okay, to wrap this up, 40 to 50 previously unknown species of mammals are discovered around the world each year. And those numbers are increasing steadily. There is every reason to think that during the 2020s, 500 or more species of mammals that, are, that were previously unknown will be formally described. The information that we gather as a result of the discovery of those animals and their formal descriptions and the patterns of diversity and ecology uh, that comes from those studies is absolutely essential to promoting successful conservation. We need that information. One of the, one of the greatest requirements in order to have this research proceed is a certain level of flexibility um, in, the, um, in the, the regulations uh, that are, are in place while simultaneously maintaining high standards for animal care and use. I think that the, this final topic is one that's going to be discussed at some length um, during the, uh, much of this, uh, uh, this workshop. Thanks for your attention. Um, look forward to talking with you all. Hello, my name is Heather Bateman. I'm an associate professor from Arizona State University. So today I'm gonna to draw on examples from several different research agendas. Our lab focuses on applied research. And so we're often relating wildlife such as amphibians and reptiles to management actions such as 
controlling non-native uh, plants or also relating that to um, n the natural resource values of say wild and scenic streams. And working in river systems means that we work across uh, different jurisdictions. For example, one project looking at biocontrol and how that changed the structure of habitat and how reptiles and amphibians responded to that uh, occurred along the Virgin River. And so we had scientific collecting permits from three states in the West and um, two federal entities. Uh, one was a national park, one is Bureau of Land Management. And then on top of that, we also have our institution animal care and use protocols uh, to follow as well. Uh, so it can be complicated when you're working uh, across different boundaries. We have a project that's long-term in nature, and this is a mark recapture project. We've collected uh, 12 years of data on that. So I'll be giving you some examples from these. This is just a brief overview of some of our live trapping methods where we do mark recapture research. And so the setup that you see here is the classic drift fence array. And there's several methods here. So the drift fence is intercepting animals as they're moving across the landscape and directing them into a trap. And so in the central area, there's a pitfall trap, which is just a five gallon bucket um, set at either end of the drift fence. Along the fence are funnel uh, traps. And so this method for amphibians and reptiles in the Southwest, this is a good method for catching things like lizards and smaller snakes and um, some anurans. Um, it's not great for large bodied snakes uh, or even really big lizards like chuckwallas and um, desert iguanas. A lot of times they could um, still be able to escape say the, pit, the pitfall traps. And so this equipment is um, not fancy and it's not anything you can buy on Amazon. So you have to build it in place, which means you have to carry the gear out there. Um, and part of the protocol is once these uh, traps are in place and they are in the open position, animals fall in and then um, we check the traps um, every 24 hours. Um, and that's part of our protocol. Once we capture an animal, we measure it, identify it, and give it a unique mark. And we have made refinements to our methods over time. As I mentioned, some of our projects are over a decade long and the state of knowledge can change in um, animal handling and understanding of maybe vertebrate pain, for example. So the methods that we use to mark lizards um, is toe clipping. And we've chosen this method. There's a variety of methods that researchers can use to mark animals. Um, lots of considerations in terms of um, pairing the method to the research question. Um, we've chose to have marks that are permanent because we go back to the same location year after year and we want to track individuals over time. And we also catch individuals of all different ages. So for example, when we catch hatchling lizards that are a quarter of a gram, um, you couldn't use something like a pit tag, for example. And some of the refinements that we've made, um, kind of the motto of um, IACUC is reduce, refine, replace. And so we have made uh, modifications to our methods. We've used lidocaine for, for pain during toe clipping. And um, we've also made decisions to not mark all taxa. One example that I wanted to give about a refinement was a way to reduce predation in traps. And the picture you see here with the zebra tail lizard, that is a PVC pipe that acts as a refuge or a hide. When you get more than one animal in the trap, especially if one of them is a mammal, um, lizards are often on the receding, receiving end of a predation event. And so having some way for animals to space themselves is really helpful. And uh, lizards use this hide, so I think it also helps reduce stress um, as well. But um, the, the decision that we made to use the PVC pipe happened during a field season. So we sort of had to make this decision on the fly. We're communicating with our IACUC community, uh, 
committee that, hey, we're having some predation events. We're going to try a few things to see if it works. So we were able to have uh, before and after uh, data to say, yeah, this really does help. And so now this is part of our standard uh, method. But um, communication was, was really helpful. And again, needing to be able to make refinements during the field season um, also was helpful. Examples here are unexpected situations that arise when doing field work. And the first example is wildland fire. So we had a project on the San Pedro and our field technician was getting ready to deploy acoustic loggers to record toads at night. And you know, the field site is on fire. So terrifying. Um, it's important to keep everybody safe. We have standard operating procedures. Um, that include a list of emergency phone numbers so that folks can call um, wildland fire and report that. Um, we weren't able to obviously the next day go in to our study sites and check trap arrays because they were now burning. So we were able to communicate with IACUC, hey, there's gonna be a situation where we're not able to follow our protocol, which means we can't check traps in a 24 hour period. Another example is like a, a road closure. Uh, we often work in, in pretty rural areas and there's a situation where we were driving out to check sites and the county was replacing a cattle guard for three days and uh, you know they didn't know about us, we didn't know this was happening. Um, and so again, had to communicate with um, IACUC and say, hey, we're, we're not able to gain access to our sites. Um, these are these are fairly rare. There's been just a few occasions where we haven't been able to check in a 24 hour period. And um, I just can't stress enough um, having good communication with your IACUC because sometimes um, the unexpected does happen. We can have record heat, we can have record rain. The second example is um, a pitfall trap with several Sonoran desert toads. And this happened this last summer. And the situation was we had really record rainfall during the summer. And so we had a lot of recruitment of toads. And uh, then they started moving around on humid nights. And so this is from our long-term trapping data. And so after 12 years, you know, the most toads that we'd seen in that entire time was eight. And then we go out over a three-day period and we encounter um, close to 80. So again, we were communicating with our IACUC committee um, because we did have some mortality of toads, they were desiccating in the traps. So we had to make some decisions that day um, to get um, sponges and, and add little tubs with water so that uh, toads weren't desiccating um, in the field. But you know that was some back and forth with, with IACUC um, about that. Our lab has both undergraduate and graduate students uh, that work together. And so working with undergraduate students is really rewarding and also requires some consideration. So um, for undergraduates that are working in the lab and doing field work and maybe having a summer technician position, this might be the first time students have um, had a job in the field or um, as a technician or, or worked um, outside. And so students come um, often without much experience, but a whole lot of enthusiasm. And we also talk about things like social media and good practices um, if we're working with particularly rare or threatened and endangered species. We want to protect that location. And we also want to make known that our work is um, also under permit. I often encourage undergraduate students that are working on our projects to start thinking of maybe their own inquiries, thinking about some questions that they might be interested in and data that they could collect uh, while they're working on, on projects, for example, as a summer um, technician. I teach applied herpetology and I carry an IACUC protocol for class activities. And this allows students to handle animals during field trips and also on projects. 
And these uh, experiences are, as, as we mentioned, are important for um, giving that hands-on um, experience to students. It often sparks an enthusiasm for nature. We participate on field trips with wildlife professionals, and so that allows students to um, visualize career paths that maybe they didn't know of uh, before taking the class. Field trips are looking a little bit different um, during the COVID pandemic. Uh, we've been able to continue doing field trips, mostly day trips or some evening trips. We can keep uh, folks um, uh, distance in the field and we mask up when we're in close conditions. Uh, so that has added another element of um, keeping everybody safe and, and thinking of making sure we have places for folks to be able to wash their hands and um, just access to um, sanitation when we're in the field. So, uh, but I will say that after sort of these lockdown measures that many of us experienced, um, being able to come together and be outside and engage in a field trip um, has, has been really uh, a wonderful experience. Everybody was feeling sort of isolated and this was a nice way to um, keep people safe and still engaging in the content. Uh, when working with students, not only do we have permits for animal handling, but we also have safety protocols to keep people safe in the field. And we have standard operating procedures that outlines um, some of that. So when running things like field trips, I'm becoming more and more explicit about what students should expect in the field. And that's because our population at Arizona State University mostly comes from Phoenix and the surrounding areas. So students don't necessarily come from a background where they've been hiking and camping before. Um, these might be very new experiences to them. So we include things like a checklist, what type of gear to bring, what kind of food to bring, what's the toilet situation when you get on site. And there's lots of great YouTubes and uh, links out there to talk about sanitation in the field. Um, so I include that information. Um, students uh, tend to not have uh, the gear they need to um, be safe in the field. So um, we've been thinking about how can we um, make sure that students have that access. And we talk about having field PPE, so students are familiar with this term, but we also need to wear protective clothing to protect us from the sun, thorny plants, venomous um, reptiles, etc. And um, so one thing we're trying this year, we haven't done it yet, but I'm sort of excited about it, is hosting a field fashion show. I've seen other programs do this as well. Um, so you recruit students that have, have these experiences to sort of model, um, this is what we wear in the field to stay safe. And um, also, where would you get this type of gear? So um, uh, gear doesn't, gear can be very expensive, very technical, and, um, but not all of it needs to be bought at, you know, high-end outdoor stores. They, um, there could be a lot of shopping done at Goodwill, for example. And so talking about that, also talking about how to prepare meals and types of food to carry when you're gonna be um, away from the car and camp all day long. So um, maybe um, uh, having something that requires refrigeration isn't the best idea. What type of water bottle should, should um, students take, et cetera. And part of this field fashion show, we're gonna do a gear drive. Um, for example, this year, um, we've been able to um, gather gear from our own collection uh, that's used and work with Arizona Game and Fish, uh, donated us several backpacks for students to carry. Um, and so we're gonna talk about this to make sure that um, students have the gear, that they have that access um, to be able to participate and enjoy these field trips. Along the lines of equity and inclusion in a field environment, um, I've listed several resources here for uh, folks to follow up on. Um, but 
we know that these authentic experiences and these hand-on experiences benefit students, especially students from underrepresented groups. So these activities are, are helpful um, for bringing in uh, diverse groups into the sciences. And field work can put, um, it's important to realize that some individuals might be harassed in certain settings. Um, and being in a field might put people into uncomfortable positions or dangerous positions. Um, working uh, across private land um, and, and being threatened in that regard or working in an urban setting. I often work in um, urban ecology as well in Phoenix. And we want to make sure that our uh, students and technicians and mentees are safe. And so that means maybe working in uh, teams. So there's multiple people together and also thinking about um, how to have individuals in official looking attire so that they avoid being harassed and having the police called on them. And it's very important for supervisors to do the homework and to educate themselves and learn about the risks of negative field environments. So here are just a list of some um, recent publications that talk about um, making science more equitable. And um, so I found it to be um, a pretty helpful uh, literature here. Thank you for your time today. I really enjoyed putting this presentation together for the National Academies to share some of the experiences that I've had over the past 15 years or so working with reptiles and amphibians in uh, remote areas and especially working with undergraduate students. I'm pretty passionate about mentoring and it's really one of the, the great joys, the many joys of being a wildlife ecologist is also working with people. And so thank you so much for the invitation and thank you for your interest.